Hey friends, welcome back to the Entrusted to Lead podcast. I'm your host, Danita, and today we have a special guest that's sure to inspire and motivate you in your leadership journey. Joining me is Pepper Bethel, VP of Business Development at TPI Group, also known as the Queen of Sheba or the greatest rock star of the business world, depending upon how you know her. Pepper is passionate about helping small business owners overcome challenges and thrive in both their personal and professional lives. So whether you're a seasoned leader or just starting out, today's conversation is packed with wisdom on business growth, strategy, and staying grounded. So grab your cup of coffee, get comfortable, and let's get started. Doing things alone is entirely overrated. We all need a community to thrive. And that's why I'm part of an online community of writers and speakers, podcasters, and entrepreneurs called Cold Creatives. And I love it. In the years since I joined this community, I've launched new ideas, and I finally executed the dreams that sat on the shelf for years. (laughs) Seriously. And I was able to do this because of the outstanding group of mentors, exceptional training, and encouraging mastermind groups with my new friends who did and continue to give me invaluable feedback. Oh, and not to mention all the fun, because we have had lots and lots of fun. Have you ever said, I want to write a book? Or do you want to use your voice for the exciting world of podcasting? If so, Cold Creatives is your best resource for up-to-the-minute industry training, expert advice, live coaching, and peer support like no other. Best-selling authors and speakers Allie Worthington and Lisa Whittle lead this community with a no-competition mission, and it shows. So join my friends and I in the Cold Creative community. Head to my show notes, danitacummins.com slash podcast and click the link to get all the details to join. I promise you won't regret it. I look forward to seeing you in the community and watching you grow. Happy Friday, Pepper. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for having me today, Danita. I really appreciate it. You are so welcome. I'm so glad that we got to connect. We got a chance to dig into some of your heart for small business owners and helping them navigate the challenges of their business and entrepreneurial life earlier this week. Do you want to share a little bit about your heart for why you serve and how you serve? Thank you so much. Again, I do. You're right. And I appreciate that intro. I do like to call myself Queen of Sheba. I know there might be other royalty out there in my family, but I'll represent this all today. So yes, I do have an amazing passion for small businesses because again, like most of us, I feel that small businesses are the backbone of our community, are the backbone of our economy. And I'm so, so passionate about it because there are so many small businesses out there who don't necessarily have all of the resources or the advantages of some. So I feel the need that I have to like climb up to that rooftop and then just shout from my the top of my lungs and say, hey, you have help. You have resources. I'm here to help you in many different areas. Because again, as you said, we want them to thrive. If they thrive, we thrive. Our families thrive. That's right. Yeah, that's so good. And I love that you said climb up to the rooftop and say that because I could just imagine you doing that every day. You're like, no, no, no. People are here and they actually do care. I was just talking to my daughter about that this morning and she was like, people genuinely do care. I I was like, yeah, I know we have to combat that message on social media that everyone hates you. (laughs) Yeah, not everyone. Yeah, not everyone. Some of us do genuinely care. If We want to help you. We, we really do have a servant's heart. So can you tell us a little bit about how you do that? How does that look like for you? Sure. So for us, TPI has been around for 30 years and God love it for it. For my partner, Morteza Gallenbor, who started this in the early 90s when I was still trying to figure out my life. But what he did and what I've continued to grow is helping small businesses. Now, initially, we started to helping them with regard to finances and financial planning and taxes and things of that nature. But the demand came out of these people that we serve. Because they came to us saying that, okay, so you help me with this, but then what about formation? And how do I form my business? And when do I form my business? And how do I pay people? And when do I pay these people? So as we started to grow in these communities, in our community in D.C., the client started to tell us what more they needed. And then we definitely stepped up to the plate and we said, you know what? We can help you with that. We can help you with let's start before you you actually create the business. Let's go in and have classes. Let's have training. Let's have these coaching sessions where we can talk to people about and let it have be a judgment-free zone of, you know what? I know this may be a, a dumb question, but can I ask you, what's a W-2 versus a 1099? I don't know what that means. What is a K-1 or, or do I need insurance? Things of that nature. So again, as we started to really penetrate 
these small businesses, these new budding entrepreneurs, they came to us with that need. And I felt the need to be like, yes, you are well represented. You are in a safe place. We can help you with all of these things. Right. That's so good. So you guys primarily work with business planning and financial planning and what else? So primarily we work with mostly probably 95% small business owners. So we help those small business owners in many different areas. It really depends on how they come to us. Sometimes people have questions and they need more of a coaching and a training. So we do a lot of that. Some people need help in the way of taxes, insurance, payroll, how to hire people, talent acquisition, and also business transition. There's a lot of people who are want to know what they do when they've come to the 20, 30 years in their career. What do I do with my business? Do I sell it? Do I give it to my son? Do I give it to my daughter? So all of those facets have come together together for us to say, you know, yes, we're going to step up to the plate. We're going to help you with this and this. And then that also grew into other areas like the government uh, contracting space. We are just a stone's throw away from DC. Right. So in the last five, six years, that's really kind of taken off the program that we have for those business owners who kind of want to step into that GovCon space, but don't really know where to start. Yeah. So you're doing coaching and consulting yes, for those small business owners to say, how do I get my SVDOSB or how do I get my set asides or how do I get my AA? And then how do I find solicitations? How do I build proposals and that kind of stuff? So good. Yes. All that, right? It's like this crazy, you know, spider web of go left and then three steps to the right. So yeah, absolutely. We offer all of that. Yeah, that's so good. That's what I primarily do now as a consultant. I work with small businesses, small to medium sized businesses who are primarily in the defense tech, but then some with like leadership education. And I help them do organizational growth. I help them design a defense pipeline. So this is what the defense pipeline looks like, right? This is what that business development looks like specifically to the federal government or the Department of Defense. This is kind of cradle to grave how that works. And then I help them with proposal writing. I write proposals, do pricing, help them do that kind of stuff too as a consultant as needed. It's so layered though, isn't it, Danita, when you see it? It's so layered. And when they come to you, it's really kind of in the the beginning because they have a thousand questions and it's like, okay, slow down, slow down. We have to take it one step at a time, right? Because they might have already their business around for 10, 12 years and they're really good, right? In the, you know, private sector. But that's not necessarily easy to transition that over to the public, right? No, it's not. And I think even in the public sector and then when you get into the military space versus the intelligence community, their cultures and their expectations are radically different in a lot of different things. I tell everyone every branch of service is different. So I've worked for the Army. I've worked for the Air Force. I've worked for DISA. I've like worked in those spaces. I have I have worked for Special Operations Command for years. I have worked in the intelligence community. I have worked in the aerospace defense side. And I've worked in a lot of these different places. And they are radically different. Some of them are the same patterns, like you're saying, a government requirement or the appropriations committee bill says whatever. But when you get down into the eaches of it, they are so different. That is such a huge hurdle for small businesses, even for veterans who have served in the military and then start a business, their perspective, they're like, oh, okay, I was an operator or a maintainer or or commander. And I know what the organization needs kind of, but I know nothing about the acquisition process. I'm glad you said that. That's such a good point. I myself, I'm a veteran too of the Navy, and I'm actually one of the the teams that I'm working with right now is the the one of the partners have been working for the last, I think, 15 years, again, on the other side, as far as a contracting officer. However, the first meeting we had, the first thing I told him is I said, the vantage point is very differently. Now you're on this side of the table. It's entirely different. And so I know I know that you think, hey, I'm going to bring this experience that I already have, which is really great if you make the right relationships. However, we just said it is very different. Again, even I work a lot with the Department of Labor, and I would have to say each institution that I work with is different. So if they have a building over here and we're doing a project versus having a building in Maryland, it's two different ways, two different hierarchies who I talk to. So I find that that's why I'm, that passion comes through in me because I do understand how confusing it is, you know, and how everything is so contradictory, right? They're like, hurry up and give me this and then wait six months, but hurry up and give me this and then wait five months, right? And then people are like, I don't understand how this works. And it's like, yeah, but I get that. I got the Dakota ring. So I understand that it is confusing and it makes no sense sometimes. So that's what really kind of pushes me to say, I want to lean into this with you and I'm going to be your partner on this journey because you're going to get dismayed. 
And I don't want people to get this made. I don't want them to say, hey, you know what, working with the GovCon industry is just terrible and all these negative things. It is if you don't understand and you don't have someone helping you in that path, as I'm sure you know, right? If you don't have someone, then they're going to go on and they're going to say, hey, I tried that. Don't ever go into the GovCon space. It's too confusing, and right? That's right. They're crazy. That's very true. I think it's good, too, that you're saying, like, I think there's a respect. Like, I'm not a manufacturing expert. I say that to, like, potential clients and things like, don't bring me into manufacturing and expect me to help you optimize your production line for vehicles or whatever. And I don't do anything that blows up. So I don't do bombs. <laughs> I don't do ballistics. I don't do breaching. I don't kick in doors, you know. So if it, if you're trying to do any of those things, don't call me. I'm not the right person. If you want to talk about information technology systems or intelligence or, you know, data and communications, radio communications, you know, all those kinds of things, leadership education programs, things. But yeah, I think you have to have a degree of maybe humility in it, especially from a small business, because I'm a small business owner now too. Like, so now I'm on the other side too. I know what it's like to be an entrepreneur, to start my own company, to do all that by myself at my kitchen table. And there's a humility, I think, that you have to have in just knowing that you're walking into a scenario or situation that it's a whole industry and there's a culture and there's an expectation. And when you come to the table, there is empathy for small business owners. That's why we have the 8A set aside and all of those on-ramps for small businesses. We do incentivize. The government does want to work and has a mandate right, to work with a certain number of small businesses. But you still have to come to the table educated, knowing that you're coming into a completely different space. And it's not possible. Like you said, you can learn it and you've got great people along the way that can coach you. But I do think that from that person who's on the other side, who's like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed, just realize that you're walking into a whole new world. It's going to take time. That's why I say when people are interested in doing defense contracting or government contracting and getting into that space, I tell them this is a long game. There's no right or wrong answer. A lot of them, candidly, they I talk to them and they're like, well, there's all this money, like it's free money. And I'm like, there is a lot of money to be in the defense sector. There's a lot of requirements. There's a lot of big problems they're trying to solve. So that's why there's, you know, but I, I say that too, but you, are you going to do like you're saying the work? It's a long game. Right. I think that's important to say that initially, and I'm sure we're in the same boat and communicating that to the people that we work with and the business owners. As I start, I said, here's what I need. If you sign up for this program, I'm going to commit at least six months to you, but I also need you to commit at least six months to me wholeheartedly. This is not something where I do all the work and then you just get all the benefits. I said, this is collaborative work. This is a partnership. And this is a, like you said, this is a long-term partnership because sometimes people get very dismayed in the first 60 days. They were like, oh, and I'm like, all you've gotten is just one certification. It's like, we got a long way to go. We got a lot more to do. We got to do a lot more data mining, do a lot more researching, do a lot more homework. And again, I like to have that conversation as I'm sure you do too, with them right up against be like, this is an investment in you, yourself, your staff, and your business. Yeah. And I think the other thing too, as the companies grow, what we're seeing is like what one company I'm working with right now, for example, that's why I go back to it's a long game because it does really require a strategic perspective. I want to be a prime contractor. Okay. Well, you don't have past performance to be a prime contractor today. You're new. So you can get some set asides and get some primes, but you can also team with these companies and be a sub and do your time as a sub and learn. And then to your point, figure out how to have an approved accounting system, figure out how to have a compliance matrix for all of your contract stuff, all of these things you're going to have to have, the grown-up things. And then you can do it all at once, but it is overwhelming for a small business to come in. And if you you don't know government invoicing, you don't know how to do the CLINs and time and materials contracts, like all those things. So Exactly. Because you can get it. And I'd say that. I'm like, that's great. You can get it. Right, Danita? You know this. You can get it. However, are you prepared? Is your infrastructure prepared for you to take on to be a prime? Are you prepared, like you said, with the invoicing to wait 60, 90 days before you get paid? Do you have enough cash reserves to keep your team going if you don't get paid for 90 days? Are you able to pay the subs that you have if you are able to? You know, it's all these things. Are you prepared to do these things? Infrastructurally, are you prepared to do these things? You are not. And that's just, that's just the facts. 
you have to crawl before you can walk. And I think, again, it's up to people like us who really help educate these people on just what that path looks like. It's like, yes, you can have great revenue. You can have revenue in the public and private sector. However, there's a lot more checks and balances with regard to knowing what the FARs are, what you're able to do, what you're not able to do, what it's going to look like when you have a pre-award audit. What are you going to have a post-award audit? What does that look like? Do you, are you DCMA compliant with regard to your accounting? Do you know what that even means, right? There's just so many layers of things that we have to kind of like break through and kind of highlight for them. Because again, I want them to be successful. We, I think we all need them to be successful, but safely and at a certain pace. Yeah, I think that's so good. So your clients that work with you guys at TPI Group, do they typically come, like you're saying, for that six months commitment? Or do you have some other ones that have stayed, I would assume, longer in terms of relationship building and stuff that you work with long term? Yes, yes, I do have some that have been with me uh, a little over a year. Because again, I already have in place a certain system. Again, coming from the military, I'm all about being organized. I'm all about systems and procedures and processes. That's what I'm about. And so sometimes these companies, again, they may be really great with construction and they have a construction team. However, they don't have a marketing team, right? They don't have digital marketing. They don't have someone who updates just their SAM.gov. They don't have someone in the admin part of it that's able to understand and do all of these other little things that have to be done. So people really get comfortable saying that, hey, you know what, Pepper and her team, they have it. So they don't mind staying longer because not only do I help them obviously get that foothold with regard to any of the agencies that they want to work with, you know, starting as being a sub and then graduating and hopefully matriculating out once they become a prime. But they really understand that it is a process. It does take a long time. And for them to be able to fill that job title on their team, I help them with that as well. But that is also a process. That's very true. Do you also work on strategy with them then in terms of, I say strategy and opportunity management, I guess that's my, I'd put those together. Like here are the opportunities that are currently in the space, like the contracting space within the DC, Virginia, Maryland. And then here are these small businesses. Do you also try to help connect them to opportunities as you find them? Yeah, absolutely. So each business that I work with, it's a little bit different. Everyone has their own special goals, right? Some people are like, no, I just want to be a sub. Or some people are like, hey, I want to know more about this or about this, or I want to get these certifications. So depending on what their goals are is how I work with them. So if someone's coming in, hey, I've been 12 years doing this and I've just been doing kitchen and baths, but now I want to go play with the big boys, right? I want to go over here. So in the beginning, when I deal with companies like that, it's a lot on the front end. It's one or two months, just me understanding who and what they do and what their goals are. And I have to really kind of reinforce that because sometimes people think, as you mentioned earlier, is that it's just floating money and I want to get it and I want to be successful and I want to be Jeff Bezos. You know, everyone wants that, right? As opposed to saying that it's, it's a lot of recon before we even get to that, before we step on one base, before I show you one RFI or sole source, before I show you any of that, I need to know who and what you are, what your capabilities are what your team is able to handle. Because you can say all day long, nope, I want to do big jobs and projects and commercials, but maybe you only have a team that can only do one kitchen at a time, that can only do one bathroom at a time. So it's very important for me to first understand what you guys really want to do. I really flush out those goals, right? I have to, and you know that too. I, we have to flush out those because it's all pie in the sky. Everything is pie in the sky. I want it. It looks great. It's shiny. I want to do it. So my first two, three months is really just digging deep on what we're able to do, what we're able to do tomorrow. Do you have an understanding of this? Because when stuff happens, and I'm preaching to the choir, it happens quickly. So we don't have time to breathe or to catch our breath. So that's why I like that two, three months in the beginning, getting everybody ready. This is what's going to happen. This is going to move fast. This is what we're going to do. Because by the time I put these two people together and I say, okay, here's a prime. This prime needs a sub. They have all the past performance, but you're going to come in with the expertise. And guess what? They already have the relationships. They already have the sole source was made for somebody like them with your expertise. So that means by the time it really happens, then it's happening with less than four weeks. So that's why I have to do all of that lead time with them to let them know. Because if I would just start in the beginning and then give them those introductions, then they'd be like, what, huh? How do I do it? Where does it go? So to me, I really have to put in that two, three months lead time of really managing expectations, putting together a system, putting together, you know, again, who has what, you know, capacity. 
I like to say that as well. It's like you have one person who puts together the numbers. And sometimes some of these firms don't have that, right? So we have to put together a quote. Do you have someone on staff or do we have to go outside the staff to even put together the quote? So is that already money that's being spent that we have or don't have? So I like to, again, go that granular. Yeah, no, I think that's so good. And I love the, I say left of launch, the strategy piece, which is where my heart is or gifting or whatever is kind of like the ability to look past the right now and see big picture, right? And to take a step back and be like, okay, in order for this to happen, I always say it's like the systems engineer, all the trains are going to be coming into the station. So someone is up here looking at the train station and calling the clock Tuesday, we need to do this Thursday, we've got this one. And I feel like that does miss a lot of people in small businesses, even large organizations, if we're honest, not all leaders are strategic thinkers. And so that strategy of having a person to be able to look out in front for you is so valuable. And I feel like that's one of the things that completely gets cut off the budget. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to do food, clothing, shelter. I'm going to pay my people. We got products to deliver. I get it. But investing in a person or team or coaching, you know, or whatever it is, consultant that can come in and be like, all right, you're doing hands down. You're doing the work. You're keeping the lights on. Let me just look up and out for you and help kind of put some of these things together for you and then give you some feedback. So you're like, actually, that system's not working yet. No, actually, your process is broken right there because John dropped the ball three times. So let's see what John needs. And I just think that's so valuable. So I mean, what you guys are doing, I think is so needed because we can't do it by ourselves back like we talked about before. Like we can't do everything all the time. We do need a community to come together and work together. And we all have strengths and we all have blind spots. I love that. One of the things that I always like to say to Danita is when people always talk about to me, like, what's the big missteps of you see with some of these young businesses or even some of the veteran businesses. And one of those things, that I always say, I mean, again, it's always things like business formation, kind of being misinformed about taxes and hiring and payroll and workman's comp and insurances. But one of the things that's always in my top five list of some missteps by business owners is not getting the help of professionals, not going to, if you have to go into an accountant, going to, again, like you said, a consultant, an attorney. Again, people always think that they, oh, I can do it. I'm just going to Google it or I'm going to use YouTube. I'm going to watch a couple of videos. I'll get it. And it's like, that's one of the things that you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. You have to use the help of professionals. Do you have kind of a quick reference sheet, like a FAQ when to call professionals? Do you guys like have that? I mean, with all the experience that you've had, you know, 30 years and like, I'm not telling you it's time, but I'm just going to slide this FAQ list over here to you. These are like commonly asked questions and it's like a flow chart when to call the professional when these three things happen. I think what I like to say with people in these new businesses is that if you're starting these conversations, and that's why we have things like free consultations, is that that should be one of the things that you utilize is going to an attorney, answering a bunch of questions, right at the start, going to an accountant, asking a bunch of questions, going to these professionals to ask questions. Again, that is what we're here for, definitely. And again, that's what those free consultations are for. So before you even go, I'm going to start a business, I'm going to create an LLC, I'm going to rent space, then you really, I would, again, that's part of really your due diligence. That's really part of your research. And I would hope that some of the people who want to be successful would be doing that and plus so much more. I mean, what we need to do, and I think we talked about this offhand, is that I really loved what Elon Musk said about people who start a new business is that we should treat them like people who have babies and you have these baby showers when someone gets to have a baby. So what he said is that if you're going to start a business, what we need to do is have these business showers and then everyone come together who are business owners and say, hey, here's my attorney, here's my accountant, or here's my realtor and here's things of that nature. So we come together, like you said, as a community of business owners to help other business owners succeed. Yes, I think that's so good. I have a small group of my phone of friend entrepreneurs or small business owners that were are ahead of the game, right? For me, I think I shared that too. Whenever I first started mine, I called 10 friends and was like, please tell me if I'm making a mistake, you know? And they were like, well, not necessarily a mistake, but make sure you don't turn left over here because there's a big hole, you know, you're going to have to figure out how to get out of it. And then just building that community. It has been life changing for me. And it's because it is so hard. Like we talked about, we both have a heart for just those people who are out there, the entrepreneur or the founder, like, 
I had just have a heart for founders. It's just like that place of just, I want to come alongside them. I'm like, I get it. I know it's hard. You're up at two o'clock in the morning. You have this an idea or you have this like baby business that you've built or like you said, you've invested in and, and it doesn't seem to be moving or working or growing, you know, very much like a baby, like you're saying, and you're sitting on the floor with them at 3 a.m. and he's crying and you're like, what's wrong with you? I just don't know what you need. If you just tell me what you need, I'll give you more yogurt or whatever. I love that. And I love that you keep saying using the word community, because I think that's what I also want to get across is that we do have existing communities of small business owners and budding entrepreneurs who are here to enrich each other. And we want to continue to broaden and to grow that community of small business owners to, again, to help uplift, help support each other. And again, I want to continue to, to yell that out to everyone too. Again, there are resources. There are resources that you can trust because this is a, a long game. I'm going to repeat you. This is a long game. And if you want a company that is not just built to sell, but built to last, then this is the, the course you want to take. I think that's so good. And I think back to what you said at the beginning about strategy and values and getting clear with the clients when they first come in is so important because maybe they might not know. So I think that's an important exercise for all of us is to sit down and ask those questions about what do I value? What's important to me? Like you're saying, are you building it to sell it? That's fine. There's no right or wrong answer. Do you want to have a legacy that your children's children's children will carry on this family name? Nothing wrong with that either. So I think that's so good. There's a hundred options, which is why I like the entrepreneur world. You can create the life that you want to live. You have the opportunity to do that. And then like you're saying, and contrary to popular belief, there are tons of people out there that will help you and they're good. They do care about you. Nobody's trying to mess you over. Remember what you were saying before is that you also, during this process of working with these business owners, you have to have some uncomfortable conversations too. Like many times I've had to have a comfortable conversation versus what's a business and what's a hobby. I love that. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I do. So again, as people come in, they say, okay, you know what? I've been making pies for my church for the last year and everyone loves my pies and I make them and they buy them and I just sell a little bit out my station wagon in the church parking lot. They're like, is that a business? And, you know, my first step is just was like, well, that's where you are today. I said, come back in a couple of months, come back in some time and let me see, like, are you growing? How much time are you putting into it? I know you have a full-time job. So that full-time job, you also have two kids, you have a husband, you got a mortgage, three dogs, two cats. So again, I like to see how much energy are you putting into this business? So if you come back to me after a few months and then I and then I hear I'm like, oh, OK, great. How many pies did you sell? And she's like, oh, yeah, the pies. OK, so now I sell it just on on Easter Sunday. And now, you know, so if I would have with that first conversation with her gusto and her passion, if we would have ran to it and let's start this and let's go this and let's get a tax ID number and let's pay some taxes. And then for you to tell me three, four five months later that you're like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I kind of abandoned that. And, and now it's just something I do on Easter and Christmas. And so, again, there's a lot of conversations that I have around that. But the first thing I like to do is I want to know how serious you are about this hobby because hobbies can turn into businesses. Absolutely, they can. But what I first want to know before we put any money or resources or bring in any people any place else is I want to know, are you serious? Are you putting the time in? Right. So every waking moment, are you working on this business? Are you making the pie? Have you rented a kitchen? Have you worked with other churches behind your church? You know, have you have other people that's bringing the pies over here? Are you, then that was going to show me that, OK, this is shaping up to be a business, right? But I'm still going to watch it, right? We're still going to see how much effort you're putting into it. Because again, once we kind of make that change and you're no longer just Betty's Pies out of the church parking lot, and now you're Betty's Pies out of the church parking lot LLC, well, now we're something different. Now we're something different. And now we have, we're on the federal government knows about us. The state knows about us. And now we have to pay every year, do an annual report, say our business license. Now we have to do what? Now we have to do taxes. And now we're going to have to do, depending on your state, do you have personal property taxes involved? You know, now we're a thing. Are you hiring people? Do you have people 1099? And okay, how are you? Are you now going to let go of that day job? And now, now that's what all that leads me to believe if this is a hobby or a business. Yeah, that's so good. My conversations with a lot of people who are like, I think I'd like to start a business. And I'm like, okay, what kind of a business idea do you have? Same thing. I don't want to take your money as a business coach because I'm very cognizant of that. Your money's important, especially if you're just starting out. And so I have those conversations a lot. And it's like, I want to sell candles. 
nothing wrong with selling candles or like you're saying, I want to start a daycare. I want to do X, Y, Z, have a lawn care business, different things. And so those are the questions. And then I immediately go to, well, have you kind of done the basic math? How many candles are you going to have to sell to be a business for you? Just your personal business, not scaling, not hiring employees, but realistically in your day, month, year, how much is it going to cost you? If you have to sell 500 or 5,000 candles in a year, how long does it take for you to make those candles? How much money is it going to take for the supplies? And where are you going to put 5,000 candles? Can you put that in your kitchen? And I have just such a great empathy because then their eyes start to go, oh, but I'm like, no, the, like we really got to have this conversation because I don't want to see you go out and buy $5,000 worth of wax and then you got it in your spare room or in your closet or your car because you're like, dude, this was way bigger than I thought it was going to be. So yeah, I think it's important. And then I think back to the other side, when you were talking, I thought about the integrity of it, like you're saying, because once you say it's a business, that doesn't mean that you can't decide, I don't want to do this. Like you were just saying, dissolving your business like that. It's a life cycle, right? Every organization has a life cycle. When I first started my consulting, some classes and things that I was doing in my master's program and different things, it was like 80% of companies will fail within the first three years because they don't have cash flow, basically. There's like three reasons, but the primary ones. That's the number one is lack of funds, number one. So when you go back, 80% of companies fail within the, and nonprofits, but right, 80% of organizations will fail within the first three years. And so you're kind of like, okay, if we can get over the three-year hump, right? You can do it, but just know that there's a lot of factors out there against you. Right. Probably double that if it's a restaurant, right? Those fail like almost immediately. Just, you know, if you have a restaurant, it's very tricky. One interesting kind of stat that I just read was in 2024 alone, the first six months of this year, there were 346 companies that filed for either liquidation or reorganizations in bankruptcy, just the first six months. And those are probably big companies, right? So the small businesses, this is probably not represented there. But just think about these big companies, you know, medium to large, like you were talking about, 346 of these medium to large companies have filed bankruptcy and saying, hey, I need to liquidate or I need to have some sort of reorganization. Business is hard. It is not for the faint of heart. You really have to give it your best. And by giving it your best, you really have to do your research. That means talking to people. That means looking up information. But also what I like to add to it is that I want you to study success too. I want you to study successful businesses. I want you to study businesses that like, I don't know if you read that book. It's so good by Jim Collins, Good to Great. I want people to study that because if you study those people that they've named, there's probably like a nice handful of one. One of my idols who I studied in college too was Lee Iacocca. If you don't know someone like Lee Iacocca and what he did for Chrysler, then I think you should know. Companies like Circuit City, Kimberly Clark, if you study those CEOs and what they did to take their business out of practic ruin, to bring them out of that and have them be profitable. I mean, again, you have to study success because that is just as important as studying your craft. Yeah. And I would say on that part, right, those businesses that were failing or or floundering and then come into that place where they're successful, those business owners had to make very critical, hard decision. And I see that a lot Tell you when you look at organizations and just the budget. Like if we were to just talk about money, right, for a minute, it's like when you're a lean startup, right? We say that all the year, lean startup and you're very agile and minimum vile product and get it out to the industry. And what do we need to test and iterate? You know, we stay in this very agile mindset, but we're also like, are these people important? And I've seen companies, same thing like you, really amazing tech companies. Companies that had a phenomenal prototype, right? Potential solution that might really make a positive difference. Scale real fast, hire 100 people. What are these guys doing all day? What are you spending 150 to $200 an hour on these people? You know what I mean? You got to just be, I think, wise about that and look at it and say, okay, we're going to do this one thing. We're going to do this one thing really well. We're going to knock this sucker out of the park. And then we get this thing done. We'll do the next thing. But I see a lot of companies at that medium size, like you're saying, maybe not, they were small and then they just scaled real fast and 100 plus people. And then you're kind of taking a step back and you're like, okay, hold on. You still only have one customer. You only have one government contract. There's a volatility here. Be mindful slow down, do something really well and be good at this one thing. Like if you're going to do construction and you're going to do whatever, you are trying to build a reputation. Integrity matters. And so 
I see that a lot too. People to just try to scale too fast and build too fast and they unnecessarily waste money. And then then they're kind of, once they get out there too far, it's hard for them to rein it back in. Exactly. I see that a lot as well. Again, I like to call a department of my business called Business Rescue 911 because they, they come to you, right? They come to you and they're already in crisis, you know, exactly already in crisis. And you have to be like, what, what? And they don't come to you in crisis for a day. They're like, yeah, we've been sinking for six years, you know, help. What can you do? And I'd be like, oh, you're not going to like the advice that I'm telling you. Because again, I'm going to go in because I study people, these level five leaders to say that sometimes it takes discipline. With all these great people that have been highlighted over many, many different books, is that when they come in to do that, it takes a system, it takes discipline, and it takes some really uncomfortable conversations. And one about that, if money is our issue, then that means the first thing sometimes I do is I got a better sense, I got to trim the fat. You got to make sure is that, hey, you know what, like you said, a hundred different VP of somethings. I'm the VP of the right hand. I'm the VP of the left hand. And I'm oh, like, what do you, so I literally have gone into businesses and I interview everyone. And my first question when I'm interviewing them is, what do you do? What do you do in a day? What takes up most of your day? Who do you report to? Things like that. And then the funny thing is, and I mean, funny, interesting. The f- interesting thing is, is that some people can't answer those questions. So you're getting paid $80,000, $85,000. You're in this big business who's trying to go from small to medium or medium to large. And I just ask you one question because you have a really impressive title. You're vice president of all vice presidents. And I go to you, what does your day look like? Some people have to say, I'm in meetings all day long. All I do is meetings. And I'm like, well, what happens after these meetings? How, what is, and then I plan for the other meeting. It's just like, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be. If we're having, again, if we're having problems with taking ourselves from leveling up and then you're having problems with cash flow, and then I see that you have 56 people who make well over $150,000 and they can't tell me what they do in a day that helps to the growth of this business. That these are tough things. Again, tough things. That's where I start in first. And again, it's people are always very nervous, right? They're like, oh, you know, because you have to justify your job. And you do. You have to justify why does this company pay you and what do you do, which adds to the growth of this business. Well, then I don't see a need for you to be here, right? If we have a goal of I'm trying to go from here to here, or I'm trying to go from sub to prime, then maybe this structure isn't going to get you there. That's right. I love the fact in organizational design and organizational theory. I love that because it's like the organization is an ecosystem and it's constantly moving and evolving and it's its own entity, right? And then you've got the people inside the organization who are also moving and morphing and changing and have fears and have all the things. And so I think there is a great, like you were saying about educating people and as leaders in, especially in organizations that where you're trying to grow your team or your organization, there is this different mindset where you almost have to take a step back and be like, okay, this is a system of systems. So it didn't happen overnight, right? When you get to a company and it's in in crisis or whatever, that definitely didn't happen overnight, like you're saying six years, but it's going to take a more creative mindset to probably get it out of it. And doing what we've always done is never a good idea because that never works. Back to the checklist. This is why I'm just thinking, I'm like, man, you could probably be like, and this is when you should call me on Tuesday if this happens. Don't wait six years to call Pepper and her team. Call them early so they can help get in. And Right. Exactly. It's bittersweet though, right? It's bittersweet. I can, like you said, this is their baby. This is their child that they've probably been in business for 18, 19 years, and they want to do everything they can to within their power to keep that control and say, no, I got it. But there does come to a point where you're just like, all right, I'm not going to admit defeat, but I am going to admit that I need some help. Yeah, I go back to that shame, fear, control triad of all that together, you know, and and I do. I think that for someone who maybe is listening, who hasn't ever reached out you know, to a business coach or consultant or anything like that. We're not all created equal. So that you got to do your homework too, right? So, but you can find these very much diamonds who are passionate, who are compassionate, who are genuine, who, like you said, will come alongside you, will hold your business just like you hold it, right? And really, truly come alongside and, and they do care about your heart and your team just as much as they care about your business and the bottom line. So I think that's really good. So how, if people wanted to work with you, how would they do that? How could they find you guys and work with you? 
Well, much like Batman or any superhero, you will see my logo in the night sky. Uh, yeah, you could give us a call. Our website, it's uh, www.tpigroupinc.com. You could uh, email me at my from the website, please do. You could give us a call, 703-288-1998. And again, in the night sky, look for my logo. You'll see me. And then you'll be like, wow, she was really right. She is the Queen of Sheba. She's in downtown D.C. Look at that. I know, right? Exactly. Again, we are in the Northern Virginia, but just a stone's throw away from, from D.C. as well as from, from Maryland. So we not only help people in uh, these three states, but, you know, in many other states. I just got a client in uh, Hawaii. So I'm always happy for those clients. That's so exciting. So do you guys do workshops like face-to-face workshops, virtual workshops, other things too? Yes. Yes. So all of the above. Yes. So I do uh, trainings. I go to certain businesses and I do trainings with their teams, do some coach training, depending on what they need. One of the big ones or more popular ones are leaders versus managers. And sure, we could talk about that all day, right, Danita? But yeah, leaders versus managers, they are not the same. So yeah, we do that to kind of help empower their teams and empower leadership and show them what that looks like. So yes, we also do with regard to GovCon, I have uh, two symposiums that I do a year um, that I bring in people from the SBA, from different agencies. I bring in people who do from the DCAA, you know, about DCAA accounting. All of these represented someone last time came in who just did proposal writing so they can kind of understand that. I have contracting officers here. Again, people who set up 8As and all the different certifications, people that come in to help you with that so that you can get that real in-life person to say, hey, I want to ask these questions. Questions too. I've been kind of shy or afraid to ask them at other forums, but when you have just 15, 18 people in a room and then the people are right there in front of you and they can say, hey, you know what? I have a question for a contracting officer or hey, can I ask the guy from SBA, how do I do it? You know, WOSB certification. So I like to have these small, really intimate groups and to bring these people in so that all of their questions could be answered. And also from the perspective of these government agency reps, so they can see, yeah, there's still a need. We still can do a little bit better about getting the word out, getting these resources out, because we're trying on all fronts. They have so many amazing programs, but unfortunately, still, people are still not aware of them. And so I want to, again, like I said, I want to shout it to everyone that yes, you have support. Yes, you have resources, free resources by the government, by the state. And I want to bring these people together. Yeah, that's so good. Are you doing one of those the rest of this year? Is there a plan to do one of those symposiums this year? No, it'll be next year. Okay, good, good, good. Well, we will definitely keep tabs and stay connected because that's so much needed. Like I think I was sharing with you, I'm in a veterans women's groups and just the women veterans who were putting their frustrations and their struggles with trying to start businesses and not finding help and not knowing where to turn. So yeah, I think that's so important. Yeah. Thank you for being a part of that group. Again, we also have, I've also speak at young men's entrepreneur groups that were started in churches. And then these young, just talented, beautiful young men who are just trying, right? They're all just trying and they, and they know that they need help. And so these young men came together in the church and then now they go to the school programs. And so I've talked to that group a bunch of times, letting them know that yes, these are the resources. And again, I think we just had one just on like finances. Just one, you know, where they thought, oh, I'm going to have pepper for all this. And it was like, it's so detailed. They had so many questions that we just did one. So then I regularly speak at that group. I also have once a month a women's uh, small business women's group that I have cultivated. And again, we want to bring more women to this group. I've also am in talks with the SBA for creating our own in this neck of the woods, a woman's business center. So again, I want them to know that in this area, there's a need. And I've already started this group. And then let's add to it to let people know, again, there's resources and the resources are closer than you think. That is so good. So the women's group that you meet, are they in person also where you are, Northern Virginia? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So good. Like a luncheon or something? Right. So we create this group that we get together. And then again, just like talk, you know, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, but what do you think about that? Well, I'm doing this and should I, okay, so I should probably get my credit together first. Okay, let me do that. And then as I go to other events, then I bring them to those events that I think would be beneficial for them. Oh my gosh, that's so good. This We'll have to stay connected. There's so much. That's so great. We have a women's business center in Fayetteville. And then we have some stuff in Greensboro too. And of course, Charlotte. Charlotte's got a lot of really great resources too. But yeah, that'll be so good. We'll have to stay connected. Yeah, as it's so important 
community is so important, like we said before. So it really is. And I appreciate what you're doing and what, how you're supporting business owners, people in the GovCon industry. So again, we need people like you, again, with podcasts like this that are really helping all of us and spread the word even more. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks. It's I love it. It's so fun. I love talking to people. And I just feel like that too. Like as you're saying, information is like a gift. We just open free hands. What I have, I give it to you and the world to be better for it. So thank you very much. Well, have an amazing day, Pepper. We'll have to have you come back and we can talk more about all the topics. Yes, I would love to. I would love to. Again, we can talk about business all the time, but I would love to, as things move forward, to talk about some of the programs and hopefully some of those programs that we're both working on to kind of get to a different level and uh, we can promote that more and help more people. I think that's so good. Yeah, that's so needed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you again for having me. Have an amazing weekend. Oh, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. Wow. What an incredible conversation. I hope you're feeling as inspired as I am by Pepper's insight on business strategy and leadership. If today's episode resonated with you, don't forget to subscribe to Entrusted to Lead so you never miss out on more empowering stories and expert advice. And if you're ready to take your leadership to the next level, check out my website at danitacummins.com for resources, coaching, and more. Until next time, remember that you are entrusted to lead. So keep showing up every day, even when it hurts, because you matter. I'll see you later. Bye.